So this, this leads me to a question that I, I really want to ask you. Okay, you've got all these voice characters. Mm -hmm. You just did a Mr. Freeze for us that sounded nothing like Arnold, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Woo! Simply, they distinctly went away from anything yes. erotical at all. It's a very dark So, game. a character. You're either given a script or... Uh, I want to know how, how does this work in Maurice's mind. You're told you're going to voice a character. Now, you've never done Mr. Freeze before. So my question is, uh, the house system music came on. Hey, we'll see if we can. <laughs> <coughs> They're getting ready for their, their whatever the hell they do in here. I think show movies yeah, or movies, something, yeah. I think, yeah. yeah. So um, we still have 20 minutes. So if we have a little soundtrack, what the heck. That's okay. Um, Zaya, can you see? I'll sing all my There we go. Let's see what it is. Yeah. Can so. you see if they can kill that? Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Maurice has to choose a voice. Mm. Now, how much freedom do you have as a director there? Uh, do you get to see what the character looks like? Does that inspire you? For example, as a musician, sometimes a lyric will suggest a melody line, or sometimes the motion of a melody line will I indicate where the lyric should go. Well, from your basket of tools, when you're given an assignment, how do you decide what this character is going to sound like? Well, you know, if, if I'm lucky, they supply me with a, with a, with a model sheet for the character. So they, they'll, they'll show me what they've already conceived, an artist's conception of the character. And, and I, can, I can, somehow I, I, I can inhabit that. So I, I just sort of go inside it and go, what would he sound like? How would that, how would, when I saw the brain on paper, I didn't have any preconceived notion of what he looked. But as soon as I saw that, you know, that pronounced forehead, that, those, 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 that knitted brow, those, those weary, curmudgeonly eyes, I immediately saw Orson Welles. Now, they did not have Orson Welles in mind. He's actually based on Tom Minton, a writer at Warner Brothers Animation, who's known for just being this, this kind of font of knowledge. He's just, he's just one of these people who just rattles off facts like that, and he speaks very quickly. But I didn't know Tom, so when I saw that, I went, ah, oh, it's Orson Welles. Of course, he wants to take over the world, and Orson was, you know, had a huge ego, so of course I'll just do Orson Welles. I mean, it's an obvious choice. I'm sure there's seven Orson Welleses today, but at least I'm lucky I'm the first guy in here. So I did Orson Welles, and that was a moment of inspiration that, thank God, uh, I did my little trick of inhabit the character, and, and what, does he, what does he sound like? Get inside of him, or let him get inside of you, and it was right, you know. So when I'm supplied artwork, that really helps. Um, and, and they went, or some else, we didn't think of that. Oh, that's brilliant. Apparently, I was the first and last character they read. They just cast me on the spot. Really? Because, well, that's it. He's the brain. Okay, now it's the brain. So it's the only time it's ever happened in my career. But, you know, it, it was one of those serendipitous things. So I, I look at the artwork uh, and, and listen <coughs> to the direction from the casting person. Um, they very often have a very specific thing they want. In the case of Freeze, um, I actually went in with one voice and had gotten the job doing this kind of almost Batman-esque kind of free, this, have you ever watched a flower die, Batman? You know, I just thought, his vocal cords are frozen even, so he just speaks in a hiss. And I got the job with that, but then when we got there, uh, uh, they started going, no, no, we, well, we wanted a little, s s s like, like, a, like robotic, robotic was the, was the note they kept, you know, coming at. So, um, I got closer and closer to, I went home and watched uh, 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 Sub-Zero and listened to what Michael and Sarah had done with the character. I had never actually seen a Mr. Freeze episode. And I didn't rip off what Michael did, but Michael's 80 and he's retired. But I listened to that and mixed it in with, my, with what I was doing with the character. And, and that came out okay. That's what that, that, that came out as the, as the Mr. Freeze that you hear on the game today. So, you know, I, I'm willing, I'm open to everything. I'm, I'm a big ball of clay when they get me. And so if, it, if I've got a good director who, who actually works from the inside of the character out, that's, that's really the most helpful along with you know, getting a physical rendering of the character. I watched uh, something that was pretty incredible. Uh, the, the moderator of the panel, our good friend Mark Kevinier, who writes Kevinier. the Garfield show, yes. he invites these voice actors that he works with over the years to come and be on the panel. And he's <clears throat> quite expert at communicating to people the joy of what his job is, is working with. He says, I hire the right people and just sit back and let them do their thing, you know. 
how would, how would I tell Maurice, no, that's not right, Maurice, you know? Uh, but one of the things that amazed me was, um, uh, and we haven't practiced this or rehearsed this at all, but as I understand it, you read a line, and if the director wants something different, he says one word. He says change, which oh, means well, that's that, that's that game, yeah. read that same line again right. in a different voice. Yeah, it's a little, it's a little theater game. It's a little theater game. game. Yeah. So without having practiced this at all, I would like you to read, say, say the line again that Mr. Freeze said just again. Please, uh, say it as Mr. Freeze. Have you ever watched a flower die, Batman? Change. Watch something so beautiful, so spectacular, rotten from the inside. You ever seen that, Batman? Fight away, those shoes. Those are fantastic. Do you know Change. where I can get a pair? That looks like that for about twenty dollars? Ha ha ha. Change. Well, I don't have it anymore. That's the end of the line. That's it. Right? You gotta <laughs> give me a script. Okay. I was gonna say, say the same line again. Uh, all right. Three different voices. Do the script now. Three different voices that you didn't use already. Have you ever watched a flower die, Batman? Watch something so beautiful, rocked from the inside. Go, go, gadget spritzer. He could do this all day long. Uh, <laughs> so he's got this like toolbox in his brain. And when the directors say, we want something different. Yeah, we took it. I, what happened was I created it in you know, the spot that all of you have called common sense. That got taken out by God, and we went get a toolbox of voices. That we can <laughs> so uh, for Disney, you've done Scuttles? I did Scuttle. For what did you do Scuttles it's, for? It, Scuttle was on the um, um, uh, Little Mermaid TV series. And so he was, uh, was bunny hacking, so everything was like, hiya, hey, sweetie, this looks like some kind of dingle hopper. <laughs> you, know? you did all the Beagle Boys? All the what? Beagle Boys. Did you do the Beagle Boys? I did one of the Beagle Boys. Jeff Bennett boys. did the other Beagle Boy. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and I can't remember what I did. I, I'll think, I'll think they, were, they were Cockneys. I think we did them. Oh, there. you did them as yeah. Cockneys? I okay. think we did, yeah. And of course, Lumiere from Beauty and the Beast. Yeah, I was gone. Well, you're really digging in there. I know, that's I right. know, man. See, These are like one done. shots, yeah. Know, I, that's right, for, for House of Mouse, yeah. And I did Mortimer Mouse on House of Mouse, which I sort of filtered through a little, a little John Lovitz, but then I took him down a little lower and made him a little more citizen. <laughs> so, John Lovitz, you were on The Critic. Well, well, yes. Okay, now, according to the internet, in one 22-minute episode, you did 29 voices. We recorded Ooh. 29, I think 27 survived. In one episode, how do you keep that straight in your brain? When you're, when you, how do you go from, what happened? Well, don't forget, a lot of these were one-liners. So, but it was, it was, you know, a street vendor and a cab driver and uh, the elevator operator and you know, just, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like 27-minute-long speeches where the whole episode was me. It's just, you know, you just do it. The character was, the, the, the script was there, and I saw this long column of, and, and the cast list of my name. So. It's, you change it up. One of the things I like to do to keep characters fresh is just I, I, I do what's called cross pollinating or or the transporter accident. You know, I think I think like you know it's a Star Trek episode and you know uh, John Lovitz and Truman Capote get in the transporter. They come down as one being, and so that was actually what happened for Kiff. You know, <coughs> Matt Groening wanted uh, wanted Kiff to to have the the snarkiness of John Lovitz, but a sort of a weary sound. So it sort of became like. It became, I started out with, sir, it seems the rest of the crew doesn't share your passion for velour. He said, yeah, that's great, but we could get John if we wanted John for that. So he can do something tired sounding sometimes. Well, Truman Capote always sounds a little bit as though he's just exhausted. So I thought my filter was saying, sir, it seems the rest of the crew doesn't share your passion for velour. <laughs> <laughs> and that became him. <laughs> Good point you bring up here. If this was a live action TV show, they would have had 27 actors, even for one line. Now, yeah, I work too damn cheap. I was just going to say. That's problem. How, how does this ha how, how, how do they pay you for doing 27 voices instead of one? Are you paid a contract? At, well, what happens? SAG has, a, SAG has a, 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 what they call scale, which is um, a, 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 a nice, non offensive way of saying the dead minimum you're allowed to pay an actor. And uh, so, so scale is two voices for in, in the animation contract with the price of one, and then 10% more if you do a third voice. 
So 27 added up being nine times scale. So I did, I did, I did, I did well. Did okay, I beat no. my guarantee. Okay. So that's good. Now on, on, on the critic, uh, you know, not to talk too specifically about money, but when, you know, the critic, the Simpsons, Futurama, uh, you know, they, they, they have a little more money, so you get a, you get a, you know, a prime time sort of show guarantee. But they always tried to give me so many voices so that it was worth the amount to pay me that much. So that was fun. But uh, yeah, the, the Simpsons uh, actors, they also aren't working for scale. I don't know if you heard about it. <laughs> but they actually took a pay cut this year, so, you know, they wanted to keep the show going. An actor likes to work, I think. I think that's the thing. Because one, well, one would almost say, what, 23 seasons? And they can't, well, you really need two more seasons? You were getting $400,000 an episode? And they took a pay cut to like 230000 Poor guys. And, <laughs> and believe me, Harry said it right. Nobody's going to cry for me. And, that's, and it's true. But I have to think that you know, it's, it, no matter what level you're at, if you're an actor, you want to work. You love, you love working. So... You know, Nancy Cartwright will do an episode of The Simpsons for four hundred thousand dollars, and then I'll see her uh, on um, oh goodness, what was the show? The Replacements. Uh, it was a show on uh, Disney Channel that I did. I played, I played, uh, I played these guys, these agents that came and just replaced people, and they talked. One of the guys talked like this. He was a Chicago guy. You see that? Like that's a generic voice that I would do for one of my twenty-seven guys on, on a show like The Critic. I just pull it out of my. You know, know where the brain's supposed to have that. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> so, so you know, she'll come there and do an episode of that for eight hundred dollars. She likes to work. You know, I like to work. You know, I'm making plenty of money on Futurama. And I could just do Futurama, but I like working. So I'll go do a, a daytime cartoon show. I just love creating characters and getting behind a microphone. What else would I do? Go to lunch. <laughs> so you're in the you're in a recording studio. You're now a voice actor. Who who were you working with that you said, oh my god? I'm here with this person. I'm in this room. You know, uh, it would be like an actor who gets to work with uh, a, a well-known actor, like say, uh, you know, uh, Christopher Plummer or somebody. You're in the studio with who? Christopher Plummer's not talking to me now. Oh. <laughs> so I beat him out for the Emmy. <laughs> Bad choice. Um, I, I, I tell you, the, the biggest thrill that I can that, that immediately comes to mind was when Eric Idle. Uh, from Monty Python came on Pinky and the Brain and played Pinky's, both of Pinky's parents. Mm -hmm. So he did <clears throat> Pinky's mom as one of those great pepper pot ladies, those, those old English ladies that they played on the show, and then Pinky's dad with a sort of Yorkshire accent. And I can't do those two characters. My, my high end is kind of going on me as I get older and older. <laughs> so those pepper pot ladies, the, the falsettos don't come so easily to me. But uh, so to sit there and just go, I am working with Eric Idle. Look at this. He is just doing boom, boom, back and forth, back and forth. And then, then there's Rob, and he, he actually checks with Eric on proper pronunciations of certain cocky words. And uh, that was good.